and welcome friends. Let's talk cucumbers because it is summer and we are eating our first cucumbers and there's plenty of time to yet harvest and so more cucumbers yet this season. So let's dive right in. First and foremost, who are we? Where are we? I would love you to introduce yourselves, friends. Put your name into the chat. Also, where you hail from. Where you hail from in these colonized lands. Sending love from Naples, New York, here in the Finger Lakes. If you know where the land is that you are indigenously occupying, sending love from the Haudenosaunee unceded lands of the Seneca. And please, if you have a favorite cucumber recipe, also, please don't hold back. Throw that into the chat as well. And I personally am looking so forward to making some cucumber gazpacho after this webinar. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for sharing. And without further ado, let's thank some folks. Let's thank our interpreters this night. Thank you so much, Kira Avery, who we see now, Miriam Lerner, who we will see and celebrate so soon. Thank you for bringing Kira and Miriam, your joy and your language justice to our circles. And thank you so much, Matthew, my partner in business, life, love, all of the above. He's on the chat. So if you have questions anytime, whether they are little technical questions, Petra, what did you just say? Or whether they're big existential questions. I ask Matthew those kinds of questions all day in all kinds of ways. And he is there for you, friends. So don't hold back. I'd also love to thank all of our Fruition crew, family and friends. But there are 12 of us full time here at Fruition Seeds making everything possible. And I wouldn't be here smiling today if and crunching cucumbers if it wasn't for every single one of them. And our families, our friends also supporting us and you also, whether you're joining us here live, which makes me so delighted, or whether you're listening to this after the fact, which is such a joy. And yes, thank you also to our ancestors, plant and human, and thank you to future generations. It is such a joy to be a link in this legacy of life and love and the gardens that we grow. And our quote tonight, I always love to begin and end with a quote, song, story, poem with something and this morning, some this evening, what is time? Some words from Angela Davis. I am no longer accepting the thing I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. And whether that is cucumber beetles, whether that is systemic racism, whether that is, it's been way too long since I hugged this person or told this person I love them. <laughs> like, let's not hold back. <laughs> let's squish those cucumber beetles and squish neoliberal colonization. Okay, good talk. So how do we do it? First, let's begin with a bit of history. So we've been saving the seeds, sowing the seeds, sharing the seeds co-adapting with cucumbers over 3,000 years. And hailing from India, cucumbers have gone through many iterations, beloved across many continents. Well before the eras of epic and super toxic colonization, and certainly afterward, but certainly the ancient Egyptians have some marvelous stories about their love of cucumbers. And I also recently learned that the Greeks who loved them so well grew, I mean, if you're wondering, is she gonna talk about cucumbers in containers? Yes. And in fact, the Greeks grew <laughs> cucumbers in wheelbarrows in the winter. They probably don't ski as much as I do in the winter, but in their Mediterranean winters, they would grow cucumbers in wheelbarrows. And when it was too cold out outside, they would wheel them into their homes. And earlier this afternoon, we wheeled a few of our first cucumbers <laughs> into our home as well. And I hope if you haven't already, that you do the same 
so soon. So now let's talk about the types of cucumbers. So there's a lot of ways that you can think about cucumber types. There's shape, there's color, seedlessness, burplessness. Isn't that fun? We'll talk about that soon. Also bushing and vining types of cucumbers. There's a delectable diversity of cucumbers, friends. And so shape, we've got slicers. The quintessential Market Morris 76 is a classic American slicer. There are picklers, which of course are marvelous for pickling. And there are also gherkins, which are much smaller. And then beyond, there are dragon's egg and lemon cucumbers, which are more oblong and more circular. There are also Jamaican burr and cucamelon, mouse melon or Mexican gherkin style, which are, I mean, cucamelons are the most darling little large grape size cucumbers that look like miniature watermelons and so there are so many different sizes and shapes of cucumber there are some different colors but not as far range as something like tomatoes for example so there are all kinds of mostly cucumbers are green but there are also lots of white cucumbers there are also some yellowish cucumbers and there are also some golden brown like the punakira style cucumbers but largely all of those colors will turn yellow and quite soft and fairly putrid as they are maturing their seed. So yes, lots of different colors within a smaller spectrum perhaps than tomatoes, but still quite a glorious spectrum. And seedlessness, let's talk. So seedless cucumbers are this phenomena called triploids. So you and I, we have this double hit helix, this diploid situation going in, diploid, diploid, double helix with like, whoa, dahlias, for example, are <laughs> octoploids. They have eight sets of homologous chromosomes, but these triploids have essentially three sets, which it's a very gross oversimplification, but basically it's like having three zippers, which you can unzip one, but then when you try to zip up the three, they're like, what? I No. So as this hybrid crosses and then tries to reproduce seeds that triploid genetics is like wait i can't i can unzip to create the right the sperm and the egg but when they try to rezip it just doesn't quite work so you see and see those cucumbers there's the endosperm there's the outside of that seed but there's no actual endosperm inside there's just that ectosperm on the outside so that is the briefest of stories of why seedless cucumbers exist and because we don't do any hybrids except for these two tomatoes that are quite exceptional <laughs> you'll find all of our cucumbers are open pollinated so you can save them and so can our great 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 grandchildren. And now let's talk about burpless cucumbers. So there's a kind of a couple different interpretations of burpless. I grew up thinking of burps on cucumbers as like these little lovely bumps. So you can kind of see in this pickling cucumber, there's all these marvelous little embossed bumps. And each of those has this tiny little, to call it a spine is honestly drama. <laughs> there were these little tiny spiky things that come, come right off and pull off. Sure so those are the burps that I learned from in my father's garden as burps and also lots of time on organic farms. Also, there's a whole other set of folks that tend to be a little more on the in the academic space that call burpless this like phenomena of being more sweet. So let's talk about bitterness in cucumbers. You might have noticed that not on the blossom end, but on the stem end of cucumbers, they're often quite bitter. And those bitter compounds are cucurbitacins. And we'll talk about cucumber beetles very soon and how much they love cucurbitacin. But this cucurbitacin is a really bitter compound. And it's one of those compounds that, you know, and let's just project on a plant for a minute. This is a plant. This cucumber is a plant. And herbivores that eat plants and omnivores like me are very excited to eat plants. And so plants have developed all manner of strategy to deter the 
herbivores. And so one of those are bitter compounds, cucurbitacins, welcome. And so it's, so one of the things that our brilliant indigenous ancestors have made possible is this selection, this co-adaptation of to be like, you know what cucumber, we're gonna take care of you. We're gonna spread your seeds. Don't worry, reproduction is totally happening, but we are gonna eat some of you. And in return, can maybe a few of you be less bitter? And so this is something that our human and plant ancestors have been co-adapting for. I would love to have tasted a, a cucumber 500 and 3000 years ago. I'm 100% confident that they would have been a lot more bitter, especially in the skin. Those, those green compounds, like cucurbitacin, is embedded in the photosynthetic capacity. And so it's so wild how bitter some stressed cucumbers are too. So what are we talking about? Burpless can also refer to the bitterness of cucumber skin, stems, skins rather. And so a burpless cucumber is one that has been actively selected to have less bitterness, less cucurbitacins, and thus more sweetness in their skin. So depending who you talk to, those are the two departments that a burpless cucumber might fall into. And our final type of cucumber, let's talk about bush versus vine. So a bush cucumber, their vines will only be two, two and a half, 30 inches to like four feet long, much shorter than like a fully vining cucumber will be minimum five feet off and more. And they can go in any direction, right? So that's a radius so that is twice that, or the diameter is twice that radius. So a bush cucumber is perfect for small garden spaces. It's perfect for containers also. And so, yeah bush and vine are also a very modern way that we now have these types of cucumbers in our lives. So now let's talk about garden planning with cucumbers in mind. So here's just a few things to keep in mind. You want to plan on direct sowing them unless you have slugs, full sun, planting them after frost. Also in containers, if you have lots of containers, plan on planting bush varieties and in as big a container as you possibly can get. Cucumbers are hungry. We'll talk a lot more about all of these things, including containers very soon. And if, you're if you are growing a full size cucumber, you get to make the choice to trellis or not to trellis. You've got a choice, just be sure that you trellis early and often. And also plan on squishing cucumber beetles or otherwise excluding them with floating row cover. Also plan on planting disease resistant varieties if you can, especially if you're planting later into the season. So here in zone five, we, any plant that we're planting after July, <laughs> we any cucumber we're planting after July, we very intentionally make sure that, that variety, those varieties are disease resistant. We'll talk about disease and resistance a little bit later on as well. So also if you are, um, wanting to be swimming in cucumbers all season long, if you're anything like me, then <laughs> you'll wanna plan on succession sowing cucumbers. We'll unpack that really soon too. And finally, um, you plan on picking early and often and also feeding your cucumbers for even more abundance, whether you succession sow or not. So now let's dive into the sowing of cucumbers. So as I mentioned earlier, direct sow is the dream. Cucumbers and all cucurbits, which is just such a delightful Jim Henson approved word. Cucurbits include not only cucumbers, but squash, summer squash, winter squash, and melons, cantaloupe, watermelons. If it's viney and spiny vaguely, it probably is a cucurbit. And all cucurbits prefer to be direct sown. They have sensitive root systems that just prefer to not be disturbed and who can blame them? So here's the thing, if you have lots of slugs, it's going to likely be better to transplant. We in fact here at Fruition transplant all of our cucumbers and all of our cucurbits because we have so many delightful slugs and I'll give you some transplant tips really soon. But just know that it is ideal to be disturbing their roots as little as possible. And full sun, 
is ideal for a lot of reasons, not just the energy, but also reducing humidity and thus increasing your resilience in terms of disease. And also after frost is crucial. And here's a fun little fact about cucumbers. The soil, they can actually germinate in a little cooler soil like even 65 they can germinate but the soil at that the air at that point can still frost very typically here in zone five so even though they could have germinated if it frosts they're just going to instantly zap so yes you can totally throw a cloche over that little burgeoning cucumber you can also put on row cover you can do a lot of things but know that definitely plan on it. You can plant a little bit earlier than final frost. Just plan on protecting if it's going to get anywhere close to frost. And honestly, we tend to just put them in the ground after frost so we don't have to think twice. And so, yeah, what's another thing that you might need to know? pH between 6.0 and 6.8 is ideal. Days to germination varies, of course, on the temperature of the soil, but from 70 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 21 to 26 degrees Celsius, they'll take three to 10 days to germinate. So if you're really trying to push it and like put it in early before final frost, expect them to to germinate in over a week. But if it's now, if it's almost July and it is gorgeously warm, those cucumbers will be out of the ground in just a few days. They don't mess around. And also let's talk about depth because as a general rule, we want to be sowing all of our seeds about twice the size, twice the depth of that seed. There can be quite a bit of different sizes of cucumber seeds. So cucamelons, those marvelous Mexican sour gherkins, they're tiny little seeds and some other cucumbers are much larger. So anywhere from a quarter inch to a half inch, depending on let that size of the seed be your guide and just keep in mind, sow seeds twice your depth. And unless the seed packet says overtly otherwise, there's a few flowers that really love to, and in fact require light to germinate. But un unless it's those few exceptions, twice the depth, sowing them twice the depth is perfect. And now let's talk about transplanting because although direct sowing is the dream, it's not always realistic. And I find that that realisticness often comes into play in the slug department. So the slug department is this, cucumber Stems are actually pretty delicious. If you've never actually eaten a tiny little cucumber seedling, I kind of recommend it. It's they're not you don't want to make a habit out of it or an entire salad out of it, but give it a try. They're actually kind of delightful, and your slugs definitely agree. So the very tender, very sweet little cucumber seedlings are fabulous food for baby uh, for slugs and snails. And so if you especially have any kind of mulch, <laughs> you are just inviting slugs to the party. So advantages are not always advantages. Disadvantages are not always disadvantages. And while mulch has so many amazing advantages, that is one of the primary disadvantages that it just encourages, they're like condominiums for slugs, for snails, and they are just ravenous and are going to take down those cotyledon leaves, those stems. So here's the thing, if you transplant them at a little later stage, so like two week old transplants, their stem thickens up. It starts to get spiny ever so slightly and not to us, but to a slug. And a lot more cucurbitacins are now embedded in that stem. They're not nearly as sweet. So although it stresses cucumbers and all cucurbits out to be a little larger when they are transplanted, it's that catch 22 of have them be a little bit larger but not be immediately mowed down by slugs or have them a little healthier and happier, but then have them immediately mown down by slugs. So feel free to experiment and explore. We constantly are of direct sowing some, and then we transplant some that are small just to hedge our bets. And then we have another succession that we can plant later if the slugs mow down like they so 
brilliantly mowed down so many thousands of <laughs> cucurbit plants and fruition seeds this spring. Another note, oh, we'll talk about slugs soon, but there also is this marvelous phenomena of sluggo. And sluggo, you just need two, three crum crumbles of it. And it's an OMRI approved and organic certification approved product that is just kind of amazing. Um, and it's a special salt that slugs are just like, oh, no, no thanks. And so it's a very effective way to deter slugs as well. So if you are transplanting, just know that the larger the soil block that you can use, the better if you use cow pots. These are really small. These three quarter inch cow pots or peat pots are definitely going to stress them out. If you can get larger, even up to four inches, they'll be that much happier. So that way, again, the game is to disturb their, their, that soil around their roots, disturbing the roots as little as you possibly can. And so the goal is to transplant them as early as possible. So like what, you know, you have those first cotyledon leaves, that first burgeoning true leaf in the middle, that's the dreamiest stage. But if you have really serious slug pressure, they're just going to mow that down. So in that case, wait another week or two or a week so that it's about two weeks old by the time you're transplanting it out. And at whatever stage you're transplanting them, just be sure that you are watering, dunking them in to <laughs> dilute fish emulsion or dilute compost tea, worm castings tea as you plant and then water them in with that fish emulsion, worm castings tea, compost tea, so that you're just planting them with that much more, you know, juicy, yummy snacks to survive and not just survive, but thrive on the journey. And within row, between rows, within the rows, you want to have two feet in between your cucumber plants. A really common mistake is just overcrowding. And so it's really important to have minimum two feet between your cucumber plants. Just the other day, I was at a dear friend's house and looking at this whole little cluster of baby beautiful <laughs> cucumbers. And she was bemoaning having to thin them because they all look so good. But here's the thing, none of them will look good in two weeks if she hadn't have thinned them ASAP. So the dream is if you're direct sowing, you sow two seeds every two feet, and then you thin down to the strongest one, the healthiest one, the first one to emerge, the straightest one to emerge, as soon as they emerge, as soon as you can see that there's two, pluck that second one and that least healthy one. And so that is a marvelous way to make sure that you have two in between. Otherwise, if you're transplanting, just you know, transplant with two feet in between and between rows, 36 inches is, imp is a really good solid minimum. But honestly, it can be more depending on what your bed strategy is, what your path, what your mulching strategy is. There's a lot of variables, but 36 inches is a solid minimum. And if you are trellising cucumbers, trellis them right away. Similar to pole beans, similar to peas, if you can just plant them with that trellising already established, then you don't have to disturb the root systems. They're just ready to go as soon as they have that moment. I find that um, cucumbers, like pole beans, peas, they tend to find their way to the trellising. If it's close, if it's not so close, they're really good at finding it. I find cucumbers tend to sprawl more. They're not so committed, although their deep ancestors were very committed to climbing and that was their entire life strategy. Cucumbers are really happy to sprawl. And so I tend to, we tend to need, if we are trellising our cucumbers, to, as they're beginning to run, lay those leaves on the trellising, especially I love hog paneling vertically um, or bent as an arbor, just lay those leaves. And just as they're beginning to run, lay them on that trellising. And then they don't need to be, <laughs> they don't need us to be told twice. They will do just what you hope them to do, but likely you will need to tell them that one time. And another tip on trellising. 
So some cucumbers like this Market More 76, which is also essentially the same cucumber as Space Master 80, which is a dwarf, a compact cucumber variety, which is just one of my favorite names of all time, Space Master 80. <laughs> <laughs> in a certain category anyway of names <laughs> they both are classic american slicers and honestly this cucumber would look this this grew on the ground it's pretty much straight if it grew vertically it would grow perfectly straight but you can see they're pretty much going to be straight even on the ground other cucumbers like Shinto Kiwa, other cucumbers that are longer are tend to, and also thinner, more Persian style, our green finger as well, that they tend to spiral and twist beautifully. I love it on the ground. But if you are attached to them being straight, you want to grow them vertically. And that way they will know exactly where down is and they will grow in accordance um, perfectly straight for you. So another thing to keep in mind, you can also not full size cucumbers and really not pickler so much, but if you're growing those dainty little cucamelons, you can also trellis those on corn and sorghum and it's very fun. So now let's talk about succession sowing. So if you are committed as I am to swimming in cucumber abundance, you'll want to succession sow. So cucumbers tend to have, be very abundant within a few weeks, a fairly concentrated harvest. You can extend that harvest if they are really well fed and also if you continue to keep harvesting your cucumbers. So if you, just like zucchini, if they start to go to seed and start to mature seed, they start to shut down production of new fruit, right? They're like, wow, I succeeded at life. I'm maturing my, the next generation. But if you convince them otherwise, <laughs> they will keep trying to produce that next generation. And so, yes, even if you miss a few cucumbers and you're not planning on saving them for seed, then be sure that you are... <laughs> plucking off even the large fruit that you don't want to eat and bringing that to your compost or bring it to your friends with chickens or with pigs. Chickens love, love, love to scratch them apart and peck out all of those delicious protein rich seeds forming inside. So succession sowing, if you want to truly be enjoying that abundance all throughout the season, then you want to have, we love to sow three different successions here at Fruition. So the first is around or right after final frost. And then three weeks later, we sow our next succession. Three more weeks later, we set, we sow our third succession. And so um, <laughs> I just see Maria, Marina saying in the chat, which I'm not really following, but I love cukes, not cakes. <laughs> <laughs> that will definitely be on my next birthday card. <laughs> Bring cubes, not cakes to Petra's birthday. <laughs> now you know. <laughs> um, what was I talking about? Yes. So succession sowing cucumbers. So you don't want to sow succession sow really after three months before your final frost. It's just too close. It's too close a call you might not have enough time to actually mature fruit. So for us here in zone five, we find mid-July is that like, we are confident that mid-July harvest, we're gonna have plenty of cucumbers, but even by late July, it we might get a harvest, we might not. So we tend to not gamble in that department. So feel free to sow every three, four weeks and you'll enjoy that much more harvest trends. Keep in mind, we'll talk about disease and disease resistance really soon. Keep in mind for those final successions, for us here in zone five, when we are entering July, we are officially sowing seeds that of cucumbers that are disease resistant. And we'll talk a lot more about this so soon, but all those fungal diseases barreling up from down south are arriving about mid-July. And so pretty much the only way to get a really consistent cucumber harvest for the end of the season is to have a disease resistant variety. 
So now let's talk about companion planting. So with companion planting, here's a couple things to keep in mind. And if you're curious about companion planting, I love you. I am too. I'll be spending the rest of my life <laughs> learning more about everything and certainly companion planting as well. So I love this kind of for cucumbers, this interplanting concept is more of the, more of the magic compared to like chemistry. Um, so think of a trellised cucumber and then think of that trellised cucumber having shade in its lee side. And so in the shade of that cucumber, you can grow baby greens, heads of lettuce, you can grow baby herbs, you can grow radishes. Think things that won't so much need full full the full sun of the summer heat that would just stress them out so grow them in the shade of your cucumbers and also um, before if you're letting them sprawl on the ground and you've got those two feet in between your cucumbers feel free to sow just a head of lettuce so some baby greens sow some you know asian spinach some herbs a few radishes and something that within six weeks you'll be eating ideally within four so that way you've got all this space in between the, the two feet in between your plants and before they start to run and vine you've got some space so baby greens, always of my heart. Um, also plant just copious quantities of alliums around your cucumbers as much as you can without being annoying to yourself. <laughs> because those all of those sulfur compounds um, aren't really going to seriously deter um, the allium to the, the cucumber beetles, but they do a little bit and certainly they don't, they defer, um, they de deter the aphids and some other creatures that aren't so fond of such things. And now let's talk about feeding because cucumbers are one of the heaviest feeding crops in your garden. And they're not like as heavy as garlic. They're not as heavy as winter squash. They're not even as heavy as garlic. Um, or ginger certainly, but nonetheless, there's a very direct relationship between the quantity quality of nutrients that they have access to and the quality quantity of abundance that you will harvest. And so I think about it in two different ways. One, the soil and one is what you can add to the plant. So thinking of soil health, always feed the crop rather than the plant, feed the soil rather than the crop rather. And so that is such a vital tenet of organic regenerative of agriculture that is actually going to feed us and not just force feed us, right? So yes, if you can be adding soil, adding compost to your soil, deciduous leaves, other kinds of organic fertilizers that are deeply going to nourish your soil and grow your soil organic matter, that so much the better. And then of course, that is a lifetime. But what can you do right now? Your plants, your cucumbers are already growing. You can foliar feed them. And so foliar feeding looks like spraying delicious nutrients, whether it's dilute fish emulsion, whether it's compost tea, worm castings tea, you've got options. And with all of those, you can foliar feed, spray the leaves first thing in the morning, no earlier than, no later than nine o'clock in the morning or you can root drench. And that you can do if you're trellising your cucumbers or when they're young, because with the root drench, you wanna be sure that you are watering the base of that cucumber. You're watering the soil more than the plant. You don't want to be adding any additional moisture to the leaves. And so that is such a crucial, crucial thing. You can also side dress your cucumbers with our granular fertilizer with compost. And I would do that just as they're starting to flower. Um, so that is a little tip as well. But that's honestly easiest to do if you're again trellising your cucumbers, because as they start to vine, they're not vining in one direction, they're vining in any direction. And so it can be much more tricky to side dress a cucumber that's turning into you know, 
an octopus. <laughs> and now let's talk about containers. So containers, bush varieties are so crucial for containers. We have two bush varieties, one that's a little lovely pickler, one that's a slicer. And so that just makes it so much easier for those plants to truly thrive and not just survive. So a 10 gallons is kind of the minimum to have a real minimum size of a container to have a really happy, healthy plant. And bigger is always better. No, it's not, <laughs> but it is in container gardening. So if you have a 15 gallon container, use that. If you have a 20 gallon container, use that. Whatever container you're using to grow your cucumbers, just make sure you are not skimping on fertility and that you are incorporating that fertility into every square inch of that beautiful container that you have. And make sure that you put that container in full sun. Also, if you're curious about container gardening, we have our whole eight keys of container gardening mini course that's totally free on our website. So please jump right into that and don't be shy. And here's the hardest part about container gardening and cucumbers. You only want one cucumber plant per container. I know it's so hard, you only want one. They're just two feet in between cucumber varieties. Oh, unless you're growing in a, effectively a raised bed, you're just not going to have nearly as much space and certainly nutrient capacity in that container to be able to sustain two happy cucumber plants. And that overcrowding will just make that much more overlapping leaves, that much more leaf humidity, that much more disease susceptibility. So yes, one plant per container. And I personally, it drives me crazy to have this tiny little plant in the midst of this great big container. So here's what I do. And I, this is just one of the many tips that I share in our eight keys of container gardening mini course. Yes have that one in the middle. But then when you plant that cucumber, also entirely surround it in a moat of something that will be baby leafy greens. So whether it's baby basil or baby dill cilantro, baby lettuce, baby kale, what is your favorite baby green? So that, that is quick growing, so that. And so that way you'll have this carpet of greens growing that you can cut and come again style generally twice, sometimes even three times before that cucumber is committed to crawling all over it, overshading it. And as soon as and then as soon as the cucumber is really ready to be taking up that space, let it and take out all of those plants so that there won't be regrowing, so that they won't be encouraging you know, more leaf humidity and thus disease susceptibility. So there's a few tips for cucumbers in containers. And now let's talk about diseases and pests, the most exciting part of every gardener's life. <laughs> so first let's talk about pests, cucumber beetles and slugs. And cucumber beetles, they're so beautiful. Check out some pictures of them. The internet can furnish you with millions. Um, you'll find some in our cucumber you know, growing guide as well. And they're long, narrow, but, and by long, I mean like a half inch. They're not that long. Long, but proportionally, they're long and narrow with yellow, lemon yellow, and black stripes, although there is a spotted strain as well. So yes, they are beautiful. And here's a little bit about their life cycle. So, so much about understanding both diseases and pest insects so that we can thwart them is actually understanding the the actual biology of their lives. And understanding that biology allows us to see the weak links in their armor, if you will, so that then we can go into their kind of most vulnerable stages or their easiest to access stages and or their least gross to squish stages <laughs> and kind of make our lives easier by extinguishing their life. Oh my gosh, this is so awkward suddenly. So yes, here's a little bit about cucumber biology, cucumber beetle biology. They overwinter here in zone five. 
and they're overwintering even in your garden. If you don't remove your cucumber vines, they're overwintering right there where you planted your cucumber. And if you plant another cucumber in that exact same place next year, they are emerging right now about late June as June latens. <laughs> and they don't even have to go anywhere. They have arrived <laughs> at the five-star restaurant that you have laid for them. So it's ideal to, to actually be removing all of those dead vines. And cucumber beetles love not only cucumbers, they love all cucurbits. So watermelon, winter squash, summer squash, anything that's viney spiny in that cucurbit family, they love and will be munching on. So all of those vines, remove them. Ideally put them on the compost. They are going to be great. Idea move that work them into the compost rather than just throwing them, throwing them on, they can overwinter more readily. If you work them in, they can they can die often. But here's the thing, if your compost is embedded right there in your garden, that can sometimes be problematic if it's less than, if your compost is less than 100 feet where you want to plant cucumbers next year. That's just, you know, asking for trouble. That's just proximity to what they want more than anything else in the world. And so in that case, you can throw them away if you want. I personally would prefer you, if you have any kind of forest nearby, to just lug them into the forest, into the hedgerow, lug them a little farther where they can decompose, um, away from the compost where they may or may not compost, and, and definitely overwinter and emerge next July, June, much closer than comfort <laughs> bubble <laughs> in your garden. So yes, cucumber beetles, they have two life cycles as well in one season. They live about eight weeks. And so it's really important to start squishing them as soon as you see them because they are only going to continue bolstering and growing their populations. So why, why? I haven't even told you why this is bad news to have cucumber beetles. They munch every part of all of your cucurbits. They lay their eggs at the base of the stem. I actually just learned that I have been erroneously crushing eggs my entire life, thinking that they were my entire life. Let me not be dramatic. For 30 years, I've crushed <laughs> little tiny coppery <laughs> blueberry styles blueberry seed sized seeds, eggs of these cucumber beetles. And I know cucumber beetles and squash bugs, their, their eggs look the same, but the squash bugs are in a cluster where the cucumber beetle are in a, are in a grid where the eggs are a little more laid out. I just learned from our great friend, Bill Holdsworth, who is, <laughs> he just let me know that I've been wrong <laughs> my whole life. Cucumber beetles actually lay their eggs at the base of the cucumber stem. So you're in the soil ever so slightly. So it's virtually impossible to find them. So those coppery small eggs on the undersides of cucurbit leaves, whether they're in a grid or in a cluster, that's all squash bug. I'm so excited to know. So I'm glad I've been squishing them my whole life, <laughs> but I, I haven't in fact killed a single cucumber beetle egg where if you had even asked me, he actually just emailed me this afternoon <laughs> to tell me that <laughs> after reading our email. I love when people give us all kinds of feedback. So as of yesterday, I would have totally shared in this webinar that I, I mean, I probably wouldn't have said this because I try to be more humble, but I think I've killed, you know, easily 10,000 <laughs> cucumber beetle eggs. <laughs> and now, in fact, the number is zero, <laughs> which is all to say the cucumber beetles apparently lay their eggs just at the base of the cucumber plant, just inside the soil. And their larvae are feeding on the roots. And as those larvae pupate, they emerge as adults. And those adults are eating every bit of the above ground part of the plant. They're eating the stem, then they're eating the leaf, then they're eating the flower, then they're eating the fruit. They're eating every single part, munching every single part of your cucumber. And oh my goodness, there are also, <laughs> so the thing is no one likes to be munched on 
And, but the disastrous part is that the saliva of the cucumber beetle transmits this bacteria that is the vector, that vectors bacterial wilt. And so that is the real dark magic of the cucumber beetle. So all of those munches, the, cuc the cucumber might be just fine, but it's that bacterial wilt, which is the absolute kiss of death. So that's why excluding cucumber beetles is so incredibly important. So how do you do it? Here's four ways. One, as I mentioned earlier, just clean out those vines from your garden bringing them, working them into your compost if you can, or if you have that compost really close to your garden, I would be tempted just to put it in the hedgerow or somewhere well away so those cucumber beetles are overwintering as far away from your garden as possible. Number two, you can cover your cucurbits, not just cucumbers, but all of your cucurbits with hoops and floating row cover. And we cover them as soon as we plant them, whether it's direct sown, whether you're transplanting, just put those hoops over, put those and put the row cover over. And you wanna make sure that it's row cover without any holes and that you are fully weighting every single edge, the entire perimeter of that floating row cover. Because here's the thing, Cucumber beetles are small and they are so committed. They are so attracted to cucumbitacin, that super bitter compound that's on the stem end of the cucumber. They love cucurbitacin. And so they are, they smell it and they go wild and they are just wanting to get into those cucumbers. So they're small, they're crafty, they're committed. So it's really important that you don't just haphazardly put hoops and that row cover on that you are actively weighting down all of those edges so that none of them can find their way in. Otherwise you're just encapsulating the party. So we literally just, we put on those hoops and floating row cover as soon as we plant our seeds or transplant. And then we only remove it to do any thinning or weeding until we notice that they're flowering. At that point, we take the row cover off, we take the hoops off and the flea beetles come pouring in, but it's all right. And those plants at that point are large enough, they're mature enough, they are stable, robust enough so that they can take a little bit more munching and the bacterial will, will be latent enough, developing later enough in their, in their lives. You'll still be surrounded by tons of cucumber abundance, friends. So yes, you want to be sure that you're removing that row cover as soon as they flower so that they can be fully pollinated. And now um, let's talk, we talked a little bit about slugs already. So I'll just go over a little laundry list of slug of which snail is in the exact same department. So you're going to be attracting slugs and snails if you are mulching, whether it's with straw or something like biotella. And if you remove the mulch, you're removing their dreamy habitat. If you transplant your plants, you'll have a better chance of them surviving the slugs. And so that looks not only like, uh, that could look like a little transplant that is ideally like a 10 day old transplant. And if you're really struggling with slugs and snails like we were this year, we actually planted another succession and we act, they were actually much larger. They were more like two, two and a half week old transplants. And at that point, the stem is starting to thicken and get a lot more bitter. And so they just, the slugs and snails are not as into them. So they will survive. Sluggo is awesome. It's S-L-U-G-G-O. Sluggo is this organic approved little salt that just a couple crumbles goes a long way. Beer, I find, attracts more slugs and snails than kills. I don't know if anyone has any different experience. Please share any and all experiences with us, any and all the time. I can't wait to hear about your other strategies and things that you've learned as well. Um, and if you are this committed, I love you. Slugs come out in force at dark. 
So when those fireflies are starting to come out, that's when your slugs are on the move. And so, and most active and most willing, they're most hungry. So they're like most willing to be out in the relative open. So go out with a headlamp and that's when you can be actively plucking them is a fabulous, totally organic <laughs> way to approach having less slugs in your life. And I don't like to kill them really. It's really kind of gross, um, but I do like to collect them and give them to my neighbor's chickens who love to devour them. So um, <laughs> just a few thoughts on slugs and snails in our gardens. So much more to share. And now let's talk about diseases and then we'll dial in some harvest tips and also common mistakes. So diseases. There's powdery mildew, there's downy mildew, there's a ton of other things like the bacterial wilt that we mentioned earlier. Um, but the thing is prevention is the best cure without question. And so they're blown, especially powdery mildew and downy mildew. Those are fungal diseases. So those are fungal spores, single cell spores that are blowing up from down south where it doesn't, oh, where they overwinter because it doesn't freeze. And so they're just barreling up as we speak from down south, generally by mid July. We've got powdery and by August, earlier and earlier every year, we're getting powdery and downy mildew from down south as the climate chaos deepens. So I'd love to just go through some tips on how to prevent disease and there's so much more to share. So stay tuned for our powdery mildew blog. Um, but here's the laundry list of ways to prevent disease. First and foremost, nutrient dense soil, right? Feed the soil, not the crop. So feed the soil in all the ways, healthy plants, healthy humans. If we have a healthy diet, our immune systems are that much more able to do the work that they've been evolving for millions of years to do. Same thing with plants. So nutrient dense soil and um, row cover is a great way also. Oh, and crushing cucumber beetles yes just as much as you can let cucumber beetles not set your back plants back at all that will help you all of your cucumbers melon squash be that much healthier then also water the soil not the leaves and just don't overcrowd. So a lot of these diseases, water is the primary vector for every disease on the planet. And so the more you can reduce leaf humidity, the more you can increase airflow. So that's why we're watering the soil, not the leaves. That's why we're not overcrowding them. So there's really nice airflow between all of the parts of the plant and between plants. And then just resist touching wet plants. It's honestly a not great idea to be in your garden when it's wet immediately after rains. Just let the soil drain. When the soil is actively having water drain through it, it's at its most susceptible stage. If you're out there, you're compacting the soil times 10,000 compared to when the soil is better drained. So on so many accounts, just resist being in your garden and certainly touching plants when your plants are wet. And yeah, now let's talk about harvesting cucumbers. It might sound obvious, um, but honestly, days to harvest really varies. It varies by temperature, by water, by fertility. There's a lot of variables. So um, don't take them too, too seriously, but you can just keep an eye, but know that it's always a window. And harvesting your cucumbers is indeed a window. And I encourage you to taste your cucumbers at different stages. Like honestly, this Mark and Moore 76 cucumber was delicious at six inches and it will be delicious at a full 12 inches. And the flavor is a little different at all of those stages. The texture also different at all of those stages. And so one of the joys of actually growing your own food is not letting the supermarket and all of that industrial normative food be what you think is food. You get to try your cucumbers, whether they're picklers, slicers, gherkins, anything beyond, you get to try them all at different stages and just see 
what texture you like best, what flavor you like best. For example, our Shinto Kiwa cucumber is so luscious. And I don't know what it is at about eight inches. It has this incredible sweetness that I've rarely tasted in any other cucumber. And it has this insane crunch, like no other, which I know sounds silly, like Petra, this just in, all cucumbers are crunchy. <laughs> but seriously, Shinto Kiwa has such a crunch that is kind of off the charts. And so at this eight inch stage, and it's very specific, the Shinto Kiwa is delicious before, earlier, smaller, it's also delicious later, but at that particular eight inch stage, it's just incredible. So I encourage you as you're harvesting your cucumbers to harvest at lots of different stages so that you're experiencing all of the flavors, all of the textures, and getting to know what makes you most come alive and nourish you, not just in calories. And know that we never peel our homegrown cucumbers. I never find that they're that bitter. And honestly, I mean, I'm kind of one of those people that think bitter things are delicious. So I tend to eat the bitter stem end first and then just finish with the rest of the sweet. But you can totally cut off that stem end that will be a little bitter. But honestly, if I'm if I'm not eating a homegrown cucumber, yeah. I definitely wash and I probably peel it because there's plenty of things that are really gross that are sprayed on cucumbers commercially and even organically sometimes like copper. Um, and so, <laughs> which isn't good for any living thing. <laughs> um, so yes, we rarely peel your cucumbers. So I just want to say that to encourage you, if you are a, a cucumber peeler, know that if you're growing them at home, you it can, and especially when they're young and tender, some varieties also just have a smoother and thinner skin than others. And oh my gosh, yes. So that stem end is always a little bitter with those bitter cucurbitacins. And if it's turning from green to yellow or from white to yellow, like my favorite oh. cucumber. <laughs> What's that? Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, if those white cucumbers are turning yellow, they are maturing seeds. So at that point, they're very bitter and turning really gross. And feel free to taste them at that stage too, <laughs> just so you have a visceral experience of all of the different life stages of the cucumber. Um, but yes, if you want to keep your cucumbers producing, even if you aren't planning on eating that yellowing cucumber, harvest it anyway and throw it on your compost, throw it to your friend's chickens because they're going to eat it. They're going to love it. And your cucumber plant is going to want to continue producing cucumbers because it wants to continue to try to reproduce and make the next generation of beautiful, beloved cucumbers in the world. So now let's talk about common mistakes with our final couple minutes together. So common mistakes, if you sow too early, your seeds are just going to rot. So hold off until about about the final frost and you'll be good to go. And then if they, you sow them too close together and you don't thin, they're going to crowd each other out and they're going to be stressed for light above the soil, nutrients below the soil, and they're going to be that much more susceptible to all kinds of diseases. So yes, thin early and often. Also stressed old transplants tend to fruit earlier, but also die earlier because they're that much stressed. So yes, try to, especially if you're really trying to get ahead of that cucumber <laughs> beetle situation or that slug situation, and you're transplanting older, like two week old or even older transplants, just make sure it's not too much of too much older and know that they tend to fruit earlier because they're stressed, but then also be that much more susceptible to disease because they're stressed. Next, if you have lots of blossoms, but very fruit, few fruit, that is most likely either because you have a nutrient deficiency or a pollination issue. If you have a pollination issue, it might be because yeah, honeybees are totally dying left and right, as well as our native bees and all kinds of native pollinators. 
welcome to life <laughs> in colonization and stage <laughs> capitalism. So yes, it could be a pollinator issue, but honestly, if you see lots of insects around and it's been raining for three days, but it's been raining for three days straight, that is another reason why um, cucumbers and other squash melons may not be pollinating. And also our final two notions, if fruit is green and then turning yellow, it's really stressed. Or rather, if it's like, bare, if, you, if you want your cucumber to be green, but it's just like they're not even seeming to turn green, they're just yellow, that means they're really, really stressed also. Um, and if also your fruit is just really bitter and you're like, Petra, like you said this was going to be really sweet and it's just bitter, then that also means your plant is stressed. And so what stresses a cucumber? If it doesn't have enough nutrients, if it doesn't have enough water, and if it's they're too close together and they are overcrowding each other. Those are stressful situations for cucumbers. So they will turn from green or white to yellow more quickly. And they will also just be really bitter instead of sweet, even at an age, at a size that otherwise they would be sweet. So let's wrap up with this invitation to sit with these words from Angela Davis. I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. And this is so true in our lives, in our gardens, and so far beyond. Whether you just want to <laughs> not accept that it's too late <laughs> to sow cucumbers. It's not. Go plant them now, <laughs> tomorrow, until mid-July here in Zone 5. You've got plenty of time. Whether you're also really concerned about racialized capitalism, I am too. Let's talk, you're not alone. And all of these things that in our world, our gardens are just one of the many ways that we can learn to be in respectful, reciprocal, attentive interdependence, where we can give, where we can receive, and where we can share the abundance and also have needs. There have totally been times that I thought I grew enough cucumbers and I didn't. And I had friends that gave me cucumbers. And now it is a huge joy of my life and a commitment that I make to grow so many cucumbers that I can share with anyone who happens to be within cucumber throwing distance. <laughs> so <laughs> there are so many ways to grow abundance and to share abundance. And I'm so glad that you are considering cucumber abundance among your portfolio of abundance to be growing in the world. Thank you, Matthew for hanging out in the chat. Thank you, Kira and Miriam for your joy and beautiful language justice. Thank you all for joining us live. Thank you all who are listening in after the fact. May we become the ancestors that we all would hope to become. And so grateful for all of the fantastic ancestors, plant and human who've come before, whose shoulders we stand on, whose soil we grow on. And if you wouldn't mind coming off mute and saying good night, ad vita saying sayonara in a cacophony. <laughs> right. Cacophony. Good night, friends. Have a good, good night. night. Hi, thank you. Adios. Thank you. Oh, thank you. What an out there. Thanks, Patra. Thank you. Thank you. Ad vita saying. Good night. Ad vita saying. <laughs> <laughs>